Hi second grade, today we're in for a treat with today's story, Nature's Patchwork Quilt, Understanding Habitats by Mary Meesh, illustrations by Kenise Powell. Now this story has so much in it where I have all the great science vocabulary that they have for us, some diagrams, and even information about similes, which is a type of figurative language. Similes, um, they're comparisons using like or as. Or you might say, he walked like a lion, to say, or like he prowled like a lion, saying he's being sneaky, sneaky or it's as hot as a desert. Uh, things like that to exaggerate, to help your reader fully understand what you're trying to convey. And sometimes in science, to help us understand new concepts, an author will use this. So keep your uh, brain and your eyes open for those similes. It looks like even in our cover, they're comparing nature and different habitats to a quilt. A quilt kind of like the one on my bed, except mine only has shapes in one color and not all of these. Uh, a quilt has tiny different pictures all sewn together to show, you know, one big picture, and that's how the environment works. And it looks like that kit in itself, if it used like and as, it would be a simile. Right now the title's a metaphor. These illustrations are gorgeous, by the way. Look into nature and you will see a patchwork of beauty and mystery. So they have all the different patches, which have different animals and ecosystems and environments on it. A patchwork quilt has many pieces that fit together to make a beautiful blanket. Nature is like a patchwork quilt. It has many different habitats, all pieced together to create our wonderful planet. So our planet is like the whole blanket. Before I go, I wanted to key in on this page where it says, you know, a patchwork quilt. What is it? it? Told us there on page four, if you can tell me in your own words what a patchwork quilt is, mention down below in the comments. On the next page, it uses that exact simile we were talking about, a comparison using like or as. Nature is like a patchwork quilt. There's our first simile. Nature is like a patchwork quilt. It's not a patchwork quilt because it's not fabric, but it is a bunch of pieces coming together. In a habitat such as a forest, animals and plants live together. They are food for each other and help the forest grow and develop. Each plant or animal depends on others, like a quilt stretched together. We call this interdependence. Our first word. There's a few things on this page. First, I noticed a simile. Each animal depends on others like a quilt stitched together. So if it's giving us that example to help us know what interdependence is, that's kind of like the thread that knits things closer together. They depend on each other. Just like how a baby depends on its mother to get its food um, or to help it get around because the baby's too young to do any of those things. So inter interdependence are all the different animals and environments relying on each other. Hmm, where should I put my words? A desert is another habitat with plants and animals that can live in a hot and dry climate. I like the pictures on this page show all the different boxes of things and animals uh, in a desert habitat. In a quilt, each piece has its own unique place in the design. In a habitat, each animal and plant has a special role. It's called a niche. I like to think of that as kind of like the animal's job. They all have an important job. My niche would be being a teacher. Your niche would be being a student. A mouse's niche in the desert would be to scatter seeds from plants or be food for another animal. I like how this book uses that what we call an extended metaphor. They're using the analogy of the quilt to help us see nature. A prairie is a grassland habitat. Some prairies have prairie dogs that eat roots and plants. Snakes eat the prairie dogs. Hawks eat the snakes. This is called a food chain. A food chain, similar to the picture, we're gonna get to this one. A food chain just has a straight line. So what it said here were prairie dogs eat the plants. All right, plants, prairie dogs. And then snakes eat the prairie dogs, so snakes eat the prairie dogs who eat the plants. And then hawks eat the snakes, so snakes, wait, hawks, snakes, prairie dogs, plants. 
This is called a food chain. The, pur the prairie plants are the first link, prairie dogs the second, snakes the third, and hawks at the top of the food chain. They are the fourth link. We have two new words to add to our wall, because food was The ocean, which has 97% of all the water on Earth, has many different habitats. That's an amazing fact. I didn't know that. Ocean water near the surface contains very tiny plants called phytoplankton. Plankton, well if you watch Spongebob, Plankton's the little green guy with one eye, but Plankton, they're the teeny tiny, tiny plants. Um, they're single cell, they're not very smart, they just kind of float around. Animals eat them and they're called phytoplankton. And it doesn't start with an F, it starts with a P. The P-H-Y makes a F, F sound. Tiny animals called zooplankton eat phytoplankton. Tiny little shrimp called krill eat zooplankton. Little fish called sardines eat the krill. Salmon eats the sardines. Sharks and seals eat salmon. This is one marine food chain. So marine, meaning it's kind of an underwater food chain. You have the phyto phytoplankton and the zooplankton. I think how I remember it, the phyto one, the phyto kind of talks about light and plants need light as their food. So this is the plant plankton. And then zooplankton is the fish, the animal plankton. And I remember that because animals belong in a zoo. So we're gonna put those up on our wall along with marine food chain. The wall is... The seashore at the edge of the ocean also has many habitats. Different plants and animals live in the shallow water on the rocks and in the sand. Over generations, plants and animals often change in ways that help them survive. For instance, the feet of swimming birds have changed to have webbing, which helps them swim better than their ancestors did. Some fish can change colors to help them hide, or camouflage, themselves, and such changes are called adaptations. Both good words. So camouflage would be your animals blending in. It's like how a polar bear has white fur so it can blend into the snow, or how fish can be very bright to blend in with coral reefs. Uh, and then an adaptation is over time things change and evolve so they can survive. Different things on them change. Ducks didn't always have webbed feet. They got them over time because it helped them swim better and survive longer. In your own words, can you answer in the comments why do plants change? Plants and animals change over time. Lakes and ponds have many tiny plants and animals living in them. They are very small, but you can see them with a magnifying glass or a special tool called a microscope. Microscope, you look into it and you might have something so tiny that your eye alone can't see it, so you need a science tool. These microscopic plants and animals are food for each other. The way that these plants and animals eat and are eaten is so complicated, we call it a food web. So I did a mini food web. If we wanted to get more complicated, this bottom part would have so many tiny creature, creatures, microscopic creatures eating each other. But a food web goes in all sorts of directions. So we have a tadpole who eats a lily pad, and the duck who eats the lily pad, but the duck also eats the tadpole, and the trout eats the tadpole, and then the mink eats the trout, and the mink eats the duck, and it looks like a circle, and then it crisscrosses, and it gets more and more complicated. Some food webs you have to really be focusing and kind of following like a maze to get to what animals eat what. So that's a food web. Right in the middle. Arctic and high mountain habitats are very cold much of the year. It's a tough place to live. To survive harsh climates, plants either stay alive all winter under snow or, more, or make seeds that can survive the cold. So they either hibernate under the snow or they make seeds that can survive until spring. Animals store up food to survive in burrows or hibernate in caves. Birds fly to warmer places. Ways of adjusting to the climate are called survival mechanisms. We read that story about the birds traveling uh, south for the winter, and I remember we really liked it because the duck was, it wasn't a duck. Remind me if you know what type of bird it was. 
the bird lost his wife and he had to go find her before he could travel. But they were trying to survive because if they stayed up north, they would have frozen. But if they went to a warmer climate, they get to survive. It's a survival mechanism. Rainforest habitats are very wet. Cool rainforests are temperate, such as in North America and New Zealand. Seattle, fun fact, is a temperate rainforest. You must go, whoa, a rainforest is a tropical place, but the one in these pictures show rainforests like we have here in Washington, which is really cool. They're cold and rainy. Hot rainforests are tropical, such as South America, Africa, and Southern Asia. Those are the rainforests you think of, and maybe when you, you hear that and you think of colorful birds and jaguars, like the rainforest in the Great Kapok Tree. But we'll get to that another time. Many rainforest trees are large. Many are cut down, and this is called deforestation. The prefix D means like it's undoing, it's taking away. Deforestation. Taking away the forest. Taking away the trees. Fewer places are left for plants and animals that can only survive in the rainforest. Rainforests have, set, have lots and lots and lots, it's all caps, I had to say it like that, of different kinds of trees, shrubs, mosses, lichens, fungi, insects, reptiles, amphibians, birds, and mammals. Many different species live together, make up biodiversity. Diversity means a lot of different things in one place. And bio means like biology, which are animals and living things and plants. So biodiversity means you have lots and lots of different plants and animals in one place, which in a rainforest, that makes sense. Plants and animals thrive on water. And there, are, there is lots of water in a rainforest. <laughs> Houses, towns, and cities are habitats for people. People built them over what once was prairie, desert, forest, or rainforest. People have changed some plants and animals by working with them over generations. Dogs, cats, and farm animals, as well as many plants that produce food, are very different from their wild ancestors. When plants and animals are changed by people, we call it domestication. So sometimes you'll hear, oh, that's a domestic cat. It's a cat that lives at home versus a wild cat who probably wouldn't be ready to live with people. Domestication is over time. So how dogs come from wolves, uh, we couldn't have wolves over time, but people started working with wolves, hunting with wolves, and they slowly started to adapt and change, and through domestication, they were able to become pets that we keep in our environments. My word wall is huge. Ranches and farms are also habitats made by people on what was once prairie, forest, or desert. Often, domesticated animals like cows, horses, pigs, and chickens live there. Domesticated plants like tomatoes, corn, and wheat also grow there. More and more natural habitats are being taken over by human habitats. When a natural habitat is gone and plants and animals don't have a place to live, they die. When the last plant or animals of a species dies, that species is extinct. Like we think about how the dinosaurs are extinct because there are no more dinosaurs. It's the last of that kind is gone. And unfortunately, there are a lot of animals that are going extinct because humans are taking up places that they live or they're hunting them too much. So it's important to be careful. Now it's important that we have food and animals as well, but there has to be a balance because we don't want precious animals or to go extinct. Because plants and animals can't speak for themselves, many environmentalists have worked hard to save them by pre preserving their habitats. There are a lot of incredible names. I'm going to read through them, and if you know about any of these people, please let me know. They've done incredible things for plants and animals in the world. Margaret Wentworth Owings, Jane Goodall, Dave Suzuki, Jay Nora Ding Darling, Aldo Leopold, Theodore Roosevelt, we know him. We have Archie Carr, Rachel Carson, Henry David Thoreau, Roger Payne, Margaret Murray, Roger Troy Peterson, Eugene Clark, Edward O. Wilson, mm, Wangari Mathari, John Muir, Sylvia Earle, Ronald R. D. Lawrence, Jacques Yves Cousteau, so Jacques Cousteau, William Temple Hornaday, and Tierney Thighs. 
They clean up rivers, plant trees, help animals, study science, paint pictures, sing songs, write books, give speeches, make movies, persuade policymakers, give money, organize friends, and much more. They help the environment in ways with that their talents work. So some of them like to sing, they sing songs about helping, or they know how to work with the government, they make laws that change it. They do special things based on their skills. When you are in nature, look around at its beauty. Consider how all the plants and animals live together in an interdependent web of life. This patchwork quilt of nature covers the whole earth, your home. It's yours to learn about, to enjoy, to care for, and to love. That's the end of today's story, and I hope you enjoyed it. Nature is such a beautiful thing to be around, and we're going to be diving into a lot of stories about nature, habitats, plants and animals, and it's cool to think of what we can do to preserve these amazing places. So we're going to do some activities about similes, especially ones like nature being like a patchwork quilt, but we'll talk about that soon. Alright, until next time you guys.